Greeting viewers, thank you for joining us. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi warmly welcomes both our local and global audience to the continuation of our book talk series. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi is part of nine regional hubs positioned around the world by Columbia University. The centers serve as platforms for dialogue and the exchange of knowledge in research, education, as well as public programming. Today, we are very privileged to host Ambassador Gurjit Singh, who has a very interesting career history, part of which was spent in Kenya. He chairs the CII Business Task Force on Trilateral Cooperation in Africa, including the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor with Japan. He comments on current events on TV and in journals. His reports on such cooperation in 2019 focused on private sector engagement to make trilateral successful. He is associated with the social impact investment movement and is working on expanding it in Africa and other trilateral initiatives, including Japan, for business to business engagement. He is an independent director of companies achieving social impact. He is also associated with civil society efforts through the Avishka Foundation and the Advisory Council of Nobel Prize Laureate Kailash Satriyathi. Abbasinda Singh is an award cinema buff who is interested in Indian cinema, which is both academic and historical. He is very fond of sports, including cricket, and is a qualified umpire from the Kenya Cricket Association. He enjoys traveling, experiencing different cultures and cuisines and meeting people. His commitment to enhancing outreach programs in every assignment and in, 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 in uh, enlarging the engagement agenda is well known. He is considered a business friendly developmental diplomat. He's married and has two children. Abbasinda Singh, we are truly honored to host you today and for accepting us to feature your book um, in our series, The Harambe Factor, India-Africa Economic and Development Partnerships. Our moderator is Wendy Joroge. She is a bookish curator, um, entrepreneur, community builder, podcaster, and reading advocate. Her work is invested in making African literature discoverable to a wider audience. We'll post these bios in the chat area for your reference. For our audience, kindly note, this program is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. As we proceed, please post your questions under the Q&A section. We'll address those at the end of this section. Follow us so that you can stay up Dated on our upcoming programs. I will now hand it over to Wendy. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you so much, Pauline, um, for passing the mic. Thank you for this opportunity um, to moderate yet another session of uh, Columbia Global Centers Nairobi um, Africa Book Talk series. It's always a pleasure. And our guest today is a very special guest um, by the name of Ambassador. Uh, Gurjit Singh. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining us today and for giving us this opportunity to uh, have a brief look at the book, The Harambe Factor. And to start us off, I am very, um, I know your, your bio has been read. It's very, very illustrious, uh, very long and beautiful. And I'm, I'm wondering, when um how this came about because you've been a career diplomat did you always see yourself maybe be adding the heart of an author to that you know and maybe you can also mention that uh nairobi is no stranger to you <laughs> um yeah thank you so much wendy and thank you so much columbia global centers nairobi for 
for inviting me today to discuss the Harambe factor. Well, yes, during my career, I wrote four books and one comic. Mm -hmm. But my last book was published in 2017. So it's been a while. Uh, so after I retired, I worked as my bio said, a fair amount on Africa. And then the Indian Council of World Affairs approached me saying that with your vast experience of Africa, why don't you write about the economic and developmental partnership on which there is not much available as yeah. first-hand information. So I started working on it and then the pandemic came, there was a lockdown, my traveling stopped. So I had lots of time to research this and write it except I couldn't travel. So I had to do everything sitting at home. But yeah. I think we managed and we got to the rather 450 page book, which mm -hmm. is now covering the entire gamut of India's economic and uh, developmental partnership. So actually it was a commissioned book trying to bring yeah. my uh, you know, experience into play. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's, um, that's great to hear, and I'm glad that you took the challenge and gave us this book. Um, <clears throat> and I must say that the um, it's extensively researched. Um, after every topic, you can see this. Um, you know, the references are there, and they're very they're very many. So I I a lot of work must must have gone into it, and I thank you for the thoroughness with which uh, you've executed it. Um, the title of the book, The Harambe Factor, uh, it, it alludes to, I mean, it's a, it's a name that has resonance uh, across this side of the Indian Ocean on, and on the other side of the Indian Ocean. Uh, maybe you can give us a little bit uh, why the significance, why you chose to title the book, The Harambe Factor. When I was uh, based in Nairobi, the Indian High Commission where I work was on Harambe Avenue. Yeah. And you know, Harambe is quite well known in Kenya in many ways. Mm. So I imbibed the spirit of Harambe while I was there. Of course, they were knowing that I will one day write a book with this title. Mm. But when I finished the book and now we had to find a title, so the India-Africa Economic and Development Partnership sounds like a very boring title. So the idea was you must have a catchy title and my previous books normally had titles related to food of the countries I wrote about. Mm -hmm. But now it was not one country I was writing about, it was the whole continent. So we thought a lot about it and we came up with Harambe as the spirit of cooperation which yeah. actually permeates India-Africa partnership. So I decided to use it even though it's a Swahili word. So yeah. then the African Union has got six official languages. So if you see the cover of the book, the title itself is English and Swahili. But the other four languages, we have got translations of the subtitle around the hands, if you see around. Mm -hmm. So we have tried to cover all the languages used, the main languages used in Africa, but mm -hmm. using the Harambe factor, the titles, mainly because it imbibes the spirit yeah. of cooperation. I think that is what differentiates the India-Africa partnership from Africa's partnership with other countries. Great, um, th that's very thoughtful. And uh, at this point, I just want to invite our audience members um, to any question that comes to mind, um, just please take note of it. But most importantly, if you can drop it in the Q&A uh, bubble at the bottom, uh, as opposed to maybe putting it in the chat section, if you put it in the Q and A, we'll be able to keep track of that. Uh, but please uh, feel free to throw in your questions there as soon as they occur to you. Uh, but Ambassador, I like how you articulated the Africa-India relations, and I like that you've started by drawing the historical. Um, the historical uh, angle uh, as as well, and I think India and African states have a lot of uh, a lot in common from sharing a, a post colonial I mean a colonial history, um, as well as uh, having like high growth economies, youthful populations. So we share a lot of similarities 
And one sentiment that you share in the in the in the book is that the approach and the philosophy for for India towards Africa is that they are approaching this from a partnership perspective as opposed to an extractive uh, perspective, which has been a paradigm that we've seen um, other nations engage with Africa over and over again. And I think if you, if you want to I mean, speak more on that, like what has educated this change of paradigm in how India wants to engage with Africa? Thank you. So you see, well before Indian independence, the India-Africa linkage was already established. There was trade happening, there was cultural exchanges happening, and then when the colonial masters had control on both sides of the Indian Ocean, there were Indian people who came in administration as engineers, as builders, as partners, as traders. So, particularly East Africa and then Southern Africa were very much a part of Indian folklore. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi himself traveled down from Lamu to Zanzibar and ultimately to Durban. And he writes about it in uh, his autobiography, My Experiments in Food. So there was a lot happening which set the trend for India-Africa partnership, including the fight against colonialism, which today yeah. I call the search for an egalitarian international order. So post-colonial independent India, basically built on the civil society, private sector initiatives, which were there before our independence and built further upon them, adding capacity building, human resource development, more trade, more FDI, more soft loans, to expand the partnership in the spirit of our army. Yeah. Um, I, and I like that you've uh, mentioned the, the human resource uh, and capacity building sectors. And I can see there have been um, efforts, there's been sustained efforts to, you know, to have this knowledge exchange um, uh, with scholarships and, and uh, credit, you know, and um, would you like to speak more of that? And perhaps how has that been, uh, given that, yes, you're engaging, India is a centrally governed body, like, you know, it's a country, right? But on the other side, you have um, Africa, which is, a, you know, uh, 54 states. Yes, there's the AU, but these states are much more independent and decentralized in how individual decisions are taken. Has that like been an additional, uh, is it an additional hurdle, you know, to implementation when you uh, oper when you are engaging with a full, you know, with a multitude of states? Interesting question. So traditionally, India has had bilateral relations with African countries, mostly with Eastern and Southern Africa and some of the English-speaking countries in West Africa. And, of course, North Africa separately, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco. But the expansion into the French-speaking Africa only came in the 21st century. And that is because of the experiment of the India-Africa summits. Now, okay. these summits brought forth a new model of collaboration. And this was initiated by the African Union in 2006 after yeah. the Banju summit, where they said the cooperation should be three tier. It should be bilateral, it should be regional through the regional economic community, and then pan African through the African Union. India at the first two India Africa summits, 2008 and 2011, adopted this formula and build this three-tier partnership, which I don't think any other partner did. Now, again, unlike other partners who had trade or extraction or FDI as the main motive, India always had capacity building and human resource development as the main motivational force of our partnership. We believe 
that the best assets of Africa lived upon it and did not lie under its ground. So the number of scholarships actually is not large, but the number of African students in India is about 29,000. So the scholarship may be at 10,000, but there is a huge private sector motivation that Indian education is affordable and relevant. And yeah. therefore, people flock here. And I think we provide good value for money. Similarly, yeah. one of the largest projects that we did was the Pan-African e-network project, under which yeah. we basically ran a virtual university. Now, it did not work too well, the tele-education in Kenya. But in your neighbor, Ethiopia, they educated an entire new generation of professors through this program. And these professors then went back to their regional hubs and created new universities. So different countries have used the education partnership with India differently. Kenya still works largely on individual and private sector efforts, but Malawi, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, they have had government sponsored programs to bring people to India to study specific subjects, you know, and get degrees in areas that those countries wanted. So I think that is the you know, importance of the human resource development cooperation. And we also have the India Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. It's a billion dollar program under which we invite youthful Africans to come to India. And they do a wide variety of programs. Now due to the pandemic, they could not travel anymore. So we quickly switched to what is called EITEC. And EI Tech meant many more people would actually partake of the same capacity building program. So I yeah. think we have evolved and we are ready to share the gains that we have had in our development with our African brothers and sisters. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I, I like that you mentioned, um, you know, that yes, uh, different countries will have, uh, have had different successes um you know given how i guess again different countries might have different priorities in terms of what they they feel is most immediate uh, is their most immediate need but i'm curious to know on the on the indian side save for um for civil society or for private in individuals um from an implementation or practicality point of view how easy how possible is there um, like information sources for somebody who wants to maybe invest in Africa or, uh, you know, or look for strategic partnership in Africa, you know, from the Indian side, what are the kind of resources that lie for, you know, for anybody interested uh, to work that in their own personal or business capacity? Thank you. So when we had the second India-Africa Forum Summit, we supported certain Indian civil society organizations to work with counterparts in Africa. And they were free to choose. But they chose their own places, whether it was Senegal or Ghana or South Africa or Tanzania. And there were the self-employed women's association. There were the Dastakari Heart Cemetery, which dealt with you know, artisans. There were the barefoot college dealing with solar engineers, uh, women being trained as solar engineers. But more recently, there are other, you know, there is this impact investment movement through uh, the Avishkar Fund, for instance. Now, that is not government control. Yeah. They find comfort in Kenya. In fact, they run an office out of Kenya and yeah. do an annual event called the Sankal Africa Summit in Nairobi. And yeah. they look at, you know, the startups who are going to implement the SDGs. So there is a variation of the civil society impact. But I think this is largely being done in terms of where the opportunities are. Yeah. So that is where I think Kenya being an open society, welcome to business, I think attracts many people. In fact, in the survey of Indian business men, which is in the book, when asked, will you invest in Africa? 70% said yes. And their choice was Eastern Africa. And within Eastern Africa, it was Kenya. Yeah. I think that speaks for itself. 
um I, yes that's 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 really great to hear and i think um it's it it would be very natural for i mean us knowing the history that yes uh, east africa and southern africa has a really great uh, indian diaspora i believe in south africa that should be about 1.3 million right um uh, people that i mean south africans who are of indian descent and so um that gives me great comfort that the confidence translates um from indian businessmen as well and they feel that familiarity and i think i see you that we have a question in the bubble um uh, do you would you like to take that at this point uh, before yeah. we shift the trajectory sure is it the yeah. question about china yes it is <laughs> yes okay so one of the reasons this book was written is because mm -hmm. there was so much written about china in africa and very little about india in africa so yeah. in my book i have studiously avoided mentioning china no comparison neither with china nor with anybody else but yes yeah. i do talk about india a lot and trilateral cooperation with others now india has a successful model of partnership with africa the harab bay yeah. factor this works this is because indian fdi brings more technology it creates more jobs it contributes more to regional trade the Indian model is consultative. It asks the African side, what do you want? It is private sector and civil society influence. It's a much more open, not a prescriptive model. Whereas yeah. some countries have tried to prescribe to Africa what they should do, how they should do it, and China is perhaps among them. Now, yeah. we have no quarrel. Africa is free to choose its partners, but we believe our model works. And that is why many countries, the UK, USA, France, Germany, Japan, come to India and say, can we work with you in Africa? Because your model works and we would like to succeed. So that is where trilateral cooperation comes in. There is an underlying feeling that the Chinese model needs to be challenged because it does not have democratic values, whereas India's other partners would like to push democratic values. India on its own is democratic, but we never tell African countries what they should do. We cooperate to the best way possible. And I think that is the difference. And also, you know, many of my African friends in Addis used to tell me, yes, China does a lot, but we think India does better. So I think yeah. we are more <laughs> focused and we tend to be more successful in what we do. But yes, we don't do as much as China does in Africa. Mm. And, and I really like um, what I can appreciate from that is a, is a spirit of which, which is mutual respect and which is a belief that, um, that African states have agency and they, have, they know their, what their interests most or they know their pain points most, right? And that they are capable and able to you know, to allocate their own resources the best way for their people, which I right. really appreciate that spirit of respect and mutual, you know, mutual understanding, just extending that. Um, and, I, and I think just, you've captured that as well in the book uh, where India is coming from the point of, we are your fellows and not your lords. <laughs> yes, yeah, correct, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's because uh, I believe that, you know, Africa has many partners, but I don't think Africa seriously believe that they can be the US or they can be Europe or for that matter, China. And I think many believe that they could be like India, an emerging economy, pluralistic, democratic, you know, yeah. having a multifarious uh, people of different cultures living together. So we are yeah. a more easily emulated model. And that is why yeah. I think we have that resonance in our mm -hmm. and and i <clears throat> and i think uh, a, a thing that i picked up from the book i think it's a speech uh, by the prime minister where he says that between the subcontinent of africa and the continent of india that's a third of humanity and if you take that as a resource on its own 
you know, that kind of a cooperation has so much potential, you know, for the two people and the two who are approaching each other, each other with uh, a sense of respect and mutuality. So I, with that, I'd like to ask, what has the reception been, you know, for the book? Um, I know it's not uh, been out for too long, but the much you've engaged with it, what has been um, the reception? Well, thank you. So a book on Africa in India is not current because there is nothing happening in, with Africa. If you write a book on China or Pakistan or the Indo-Pacific, those are the current themes. So many people say writing a book on Africa in this time was a courageous act. Well, I think it was courageous, but it also had a lot of my passion into it. Yeah. Now, when the book came out, Frankly, I don't think the publisher thought it would do well. But even before the book was formally launched, I found that on Amazon it was sold out. So we had to go into reprint to wow. put it out. So it has done better than anticipated, which makes me happy because to bring Africa into a, a thought narrative is very important. So my passion could not end with publishing the book. I have been doing a large amount of book discussions and book promotions with universities, with think tanks, and outside. And I think mm -hmm. the book has got, despite the current issues of Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific, the book has yeah. got fairly good coverage in the Indian media and drawn attention. What is more heartening is that my colleague, my former colleagues in the Ministry of External Affairs said that they were all reading the book with great interest because it had many ideas to take the India-Africa relationship forward. So I think that was a good sign for me that perhaps my passion was paying some dividend. Great. Um, that's great to hear. I mean, I think that's every author's dream. And for a book that is about partnership and a book that is uh, uh, initially published in, the, in India, what do you do you know if your publishers have any distribution plans you know to make it accessible in the continent um is there is that something that you're working towards because i think this is a really useful um text that should be you know in both hands yes it's in, available in india but how about africa thank you yes so this is something that we discussed with the publisher who was a bit taken aback because I don't think he expected to export his books, but he has got export orders which he has been, been fulfilling. So what we persuaded them to do was to create a Kindle edition. And the Kindle edition is now available through Amazon India, which can be downloaded anywhere. So, you know, a rather fat book to physically carry it out is a, quite a task, but I think a Kindle edition is the, the best we have got, but yes, if we get an African publisher who is interested, we will be happy to collaborate through my publisher to have an African edition of it. Okay, that's, um, that's great to hear. If there are any publishers uh, listening to this, uh, please could you reach out? <laughs> um, and I, I just want to take us back a little bit um, to the question that you had just addressed. Uh, I, I will read it out for the record uh, because I, I've, in hindsight, I've realized that uh, the people don't have access to what the question read, reads. Oh, okay. And this was a question that was asked um, to the ambassador, whether do you feel threatened by the increasing presence of China in African countries? And does it, and does India in this case have a strategy to counter this? So this is just for the record, the question that the ambassador has just um, covered and uh, I think you mentioned that it, it was very intentional to leave out any mention, any comparisons, or uh, any airplay air to the Chinese question because that's been extensively um, covered in press and in other publications as well. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, Mr. Ambassador, if you, what are the, I know you, Tackled, I um, mean, you mentioned the uh, the question, the issue that there have been a bit of some challenges, or not challenges really, but a slow start 
to the engagement with countries that are not Anglophone, you know, like that not English speaking. And even I think within the continent, a language barrier remains a very big uh, impediment to trade, to engagement, to movement and cultural exchange. And in your case, um, I know you made an effort to, you know, to communicate that this book is for everybody, but by adding the title in different uh, subjects. But for the purposes of uh, the India-Africa partnership, uh, what are the re what resources are there for you know both parties to engage beyond the barrier of language? So when we did the Pan-African e-network project, which had the tele-education and telemedicine component, there we actually had French language courses as well. So if you wanted to do a master's in economics, you could very well do it in French. So that project, which was in 47 African countries, actually had that provision to do it in French or English. We hadn't progressed to Portuguese and Spanish, but we had done it in uh, these two languages. <laughs> Now, the high-tech program largely runs in English, and so do our scholarships. But when we promoted the credit lines, the, you know, the concessional lines of credit, then Indian businessmen ventured into many French-speaking and Portuguese-speaking countries. And in fact, uh, Mozambique became one of the biggest users of Indian credit, and the trade and investment with Mozambique went up. The same with Senegal, and the same with happened with the Mali and other countries like that. So it is then this penetration of the businessmen went very deep in all over Africa. Beyond that, when you look at cultural exchange program, yes, those also we try and cover. But there was a part of our India-Africa partnership an offer to set up institutions in African countries. So we had serious challenges in some countries which were small and non-English speaking. So even our teams which go there could not communicate. They were inadequate interpreters. So the projects didn't take off. But that is only part of the reason because after all, even with Kenya, not a single Indian project took off. Though Kenyans speak very good English. So it is not only language. There also yeah. has to be intent of the country and how much ownership they have. I'll give you an example of Senegal. Senegal yeah. has an entrepreneurship development training center, which has trained 6,000 students from eight French speaking countries. And currently yeah. there are 300 students there. So they have overcome the French barrier because we have localized, we built it, gave them the curricula and they trained yeah. their own teachers. But the same project in an English speaking country in Africa has failed to take off. So it is not only language, it is commitment and ownership also, which makes projects and other aspects of engagement succeed. Um, do you have any, um, I mean, as somebody that's been uh, in diplomatic spaces, um, I mean, uh, that extensively, what uh, what solutions or what tactics would you would you advise for people to be able to overcome such challenges that come in like uh, you know that stall partnerships uh, which are really good and which could have a lot of impact? Um, any pointers that you know anybody in um, in collaboration could use? Yes, I think at the bilateral level we need more civil society and uh, investment related projects. So yeah. I think those are best done through civil society and the investors and the local uh, you know, recipients. But yeah. if the governments at bilateral level require a certain amount of engagement with India, we are open to requests and we will happily deal with them. The mm -hmm. same goes to the regional economic community. Under the Africa Continental FTA, they have a far greater opportunity to attract Indian investment for regional markets. We are happy to work with them through the business organization. At the level of the African Union, I think we need to change. We need not do projects to them. 
because those don't succeed very well because the African Union was unable to persuade the host countries to take ownership of the project they were recommending. So I think with the African Union, we should discuss continent-wide issues. You know, for instance, the African Health Agency, the CDC, to deal with the pandemic, the African Medicines Agency to deal with yeah. pharmaceutical production, the issues of desertification, climate change, I think the larger continent-wide issue is what we should discuss with the African Union to have yeah. commonality of position and to make sure that African voices are heard wherever India can help Africa. Mm. Okay, I like that dual approach of, um, you know, um, having a clear focus of this is what, these are the issues that we can take to the AU and these are the issues that we can take uh, on via bilateral um, channels. And um, this is just a reminder to anybody that might have joined us uh, post the start. We are engaging um, with the ambassador. And if you have any questions uh, with regards to the discussion thus far, or um, even in, uh, with regards to the book, The Harambe Factor, in case you've been able to get a copy, um, or any other questions that come to mind uh, throughout the discussion, please feel free to use the Q&A bubble at the bottom and uh, we'll be able to get um, a view of your questions. Um, I know you mentioned, uh, Mr. Ambassador, previously that the book was a commission um, because the, you know, in part the summit, the fourth edition of the summit could not uh, take part. And would you be able to know whether the summits, I mean, I, I know the pandemic, uh, the COVID is still with us, but the extent to which uh, it is, is a lot more manageable than say two years ago. And with that, in light of that, uh, any plans maybe to like have the summit back and would this book be, is it something that will be part of that? Yes. Thank you. So I think that the, during the course of various book promotion events recently, mm -hmm. senior officials of my government said that they were keen to host the India-Africa summit, perhaps next year. But for that, they would need to find a convenient time and to discuss this with the African Union, who is the co-host of the summit. You know, next year, India has a busy calendar. India will be the chair of the G20. And I think also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So, and the BRICS. So, there are many things happening. And similarly, African Union went behind due to the pandemic in some of its summits. So, mm -hmm. many got delayed. So, I think we have to find a mutually acceptable calendar date and then yeah. move forward. And whenever India prepares for that summit, I hope that ideas in my book for new engagement will find merit. The other day, we had some African interlocutors discussing the book with us, and they said that they found it very useful, and they would be recommending to their government to use the ideas in this book to make a better partnership with India, which, as I said, should be private sector led, have more civil society, should not be dependent only on large loans, but should yeah. look at more investments, PPP projects and such cross fertilization. Yeah. Um, and at this um, at this point, I would like to maybe ask, uh, given uh, the experience with both on both sides, what are some of those uh, sectors where you know for a fact that um, you know, like the African African counterparts could benefit greatly? Like, what are those sectors that um maybe you can run us through briefly um so if there's anybody in the audience or even after this if you operate in any of these sectors that india is somewhere you can look up you can look forward to or you can seek out uh, strategic partners um yeah would you so i think mm -hmm. the first sector should be health health sector yeah. So we have discussed the medical tourism, 
There's a large amount of affordable Indian drugs which help African countries to run their basic health programs. But I think we need to invest in vaccines into Africa. And I was very happy the other day at Davos, during the World Economic Forum, India leading vaccine maker, the Covishield, actually said, yes, I am discussing to manufacture it in Africa. But manufacturing vaccine is one thing. There is the delivery mechanism of vaccines, which also need to be made. So you can't just say, I'll give you the vaccine, but not the needle and not the gloves. And so I think we need to take the whole uh, you know, assembly line down into Africa. The second area uh, is that, you know, AIDS, HIV AIDS in Africa was controlled largely through Indian medicine, as was yes. meningitis. So I think we have a proven capacity to work with Africa on the health sector. The second area is that we should encourage more Indian hospitals to open or work in tandem with African hospitals. And that will help. But these are private investment decisions. So it is largely to individual countries. I have been discussing projects in Tunisia, Rwanda, Mozambique, Kenya, Nigeria. It takes time for them to come to food. Another ma major area is agriculture. Yeah. You know, India is very strong agriculture. We are the second largest producer of food in the world. Besides medicine, we also... So I think in India, we produce Indians the most and then we produce medicine, and then we produce food. So I think we can help Africa to grow more food. I know Africa grows a lot of agricultural commodities which it exports, but then it imports food. So I think we should look at more food production in Africa through inviting Indian investment and using the regional trade mechanisms of the continental FTA. So here, the SCADEP, you know, the CAADP, which is the African Plan for Agricultural Development, should be discussed with India. And we are ready to take up capacity building, investment. It has to be a multi-level approach. Yeah. Similarly, there is also the climate challenge, you know, the renewable energy. We are yeah. ready to work with Africa, to, especially in countries which do not have oil and coal, to build on uh, the renewable energy. Most African countries are members of the International Solar Alliance, which is led by India. And we are ready to take that agenda forward and give, the you know, use, not give, use the sun to harness its energy to bring Africa villages and remote places onto the grid. And I think we have seen it in a small way in many countries. We can scale this up to much larger, but it requires policy uh, adjustments to have proper power purchase agreements to take it to the grid. So those parts are still missing. Otherwise, the fund would probably be available to do this. And finally, there is trade facilitation linked to infrastructure development. And that is critical. Whether you have a light up Africa, power Africa, or you have you know roads and railways, I think many partners are ready to do it. And now India and the European Union and India and Japan are ready to work together in Africa at your behest to undertake projects in these sectors. So I think we are trying to come up into place into bring up projects which will not cause you debt stress, but will complement your economic growth. That I think is the so few sectors that I would offhand mention. And these are also mentioned in the concluding chapter of my book as the yes. new trust area should work on. Mm. Okay, that's, that's a great overview. And um, I think I would like to flip that uh, as another question, uh, because again, I think at the beginning of the discussion, we established that the engagement, uh, the spirit of engagement has been mutual um, collaboration and respect. And so if you were addressing a group of, um, you know, uh, people that say like a businessman or, um, or government officials in Africa with regards to what the opportunities lie in India, what would you say those are, what are the things that from your standing you see that Africa has to offer India in that sense, in the opposite direction? 
Well, you know, for the last decade, Africa runs a trade surplus with India. But that is mainly because of energy exports, mainly from West Africa. In Eastern Africa, it is still a trade surplus in India's favor. So in the book, I have mentioned some programs. One that we did in Rwanda and Ethiopia. And another one, I think, is called Sita, which we did in Kenya which essentially was to improve the marketing and access capacity for local small and medium enterprises and then take them to India to show the design, the marketing, uh, you know, uh, make partners. So one is to bring Indian technology so you can export more to India or you just produce more for your own country. The second one was to improve production for the Indian market. So I think these are some programs that India has done. We would like Eastern African countries to export more to India. Now we have a duty-free tariff preference scheme under which 34 African least developed countries have a preferential tariff access to India. Kenya is not among them, but around you there are many countries who take advantage of that. Now the advantage has not been fully taken even though 96% of tariff lines are covered because of inadequate production and transport facilities. So yeah. I think there also is the requirement of Indian FDI to help, you know, procure and produce, let us say, dal or vegetables or things like that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which can then go. But for instance, cashew nuts. There are countries in Africa which run a trade surplus simply exporting cashew nuts to India. These kind of things can be expanded. Yeah. Kenya is a far more developed market, but Tanzania and Mozambique, for instance, export a lot of cash nuts to India. Then yeah. in West Africa, ran a trade surplus with India only on cash nuts. But we don't want to be dependent on single commodity. We would like to go into manufactured goods. We would like more service sector. So I think the kind of India model of cooperation with Kenya in the private sector is something that we would like to carry to other African countries. Yeah. Okay. That's um, that's great to hear. I hope um, anybody in the audience is uh, is taking notes of this really. Um, and of course, more than taking notes is uh, get a copy of the book. Um, if you're on if you're in India, I believe that it's available in a regular trade. Uh, but if you're not, uh, the book is available on Amazon or is being uh, worked on to be available on Amazon, correct? A Kindle, yeah. a Kindle edition is available now. Uh, the Kindle edition yeah. is available on the app. Um, as a closing question, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I would just like to ask you, what, ha what was the hope, what was your hope for putting together this book? And, yeah, and what I, what can we expect from you uh, moving forward as far as, you know, continuing with your authoring career? So I think uh, this book translated my passion for Africa and brought it into fruition. And that mm -hmm. I think is a big load off my chest that I could do this. Otherwise, I had so much love for Africa embedded in me. And I have two friends in the audience today, Professor Renu Modi. In fact, she has posted a link to her book, edited book, in which I wrote a whole chapter on India-Africa Sustainable Agricultural Cooperation. And she reminds yeah. me of that. I also see my friend Rasna Wara, who's Kenyan. And uh, yes. she has written many books, and she is the civil society Indian diaspora link that I was talking to you about. A person who's Kenyan, of Indian yeah. origin, but knows India so well. So I think these are the people who have helped India relate to Kenya and East Africa in many ways. So what next? Right now, you know, the Ukraine crisis, the Quad, the Indo-Pacific, all that takes up much of my time, Europe, ASEAN, East Asia, and I write a fair amount on it. But yeah. I would like to write now a fiction novel bringing in experiences of different countries that I have lived in, you know, yeah. and see whether uh, Nyama Choma can be eaten in Bali and see <laughs> how you go from there. 
<laughs> oh, great. Uh, I think that would be a very interesting one. Uh, please definitely make sure that you alert us um, and the team at uh, CGC Nairobi when that, when that happens. Um, we'd love to know of it. Um, I, I don't see any other questions that we have from the audience. And I think uh, from you've really done a good job of giving an oversight of the book, um, the spirit with which it came together and your hopes for the book. So I think the rest, we leave it for the people to actually uh, get a copy of the book, to read it, and most importantly, to implement um, a lot of the good ideas that you've um, articulated in the book for mutual collaboration. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to hand this over back to the team at CGC, unless uh, Ambassador, you have one parting, the last well, I would like to thoughts. thank you, Wendy. You read yeah. the book, you had very pertinent observations and yeah. you brought the book to life. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you, thank you so much for your time and, and for this book. Um, Sandra and Pauline at CGC. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for moderating the session. We are very grateful for the dedication you gave to CGC Nairobi. Thank you so much. Ambassador Singh, thank you so, so much for taking the time of the day to come and speak to us more greatly about your book. I have particularly paid uh, more attention to the partnerships that you see as Africa, we can be able to leverage on when it comes to just enhancing deeper our partnerships in, with India. I particularly loved how you were passionate and talking about health. And that is something I would also like to do more research more about because we always find more people uh, going to India for treatment, especially when it comes to cancer and diabetes and things like that. So with enhanced partnerships, I believe that we can be able to build the manpower, the skills of our people to be able to further just help them know what it is that they can do better in terms of um, the health sector. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward for the fiction book and to, to see you, the kind of experiences that you will talk about. That is so funny and I would like to read more upon on that. Have a Thank wonderful you, Sandra. day. Thank you very much. And thank you to CGC for arranging this. Most grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you thank to you. our audience. And we hope to have you uh, on our next session on the African Book Talk series. We shall be looking into the big conservation lie. It's an interesting read to see how resources have been depleted and taken away from the African people. So we would love to meet you again on June 15th for another invigorating session. Have a wonderful day. Kwaheri, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Sandra. Pauline. Mm, bye.